Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Randall Reed Smith, and I sit on the governor's cabinet as his curator for the West Virginia Department of Arts, Culture, and History. And we're very happy today to have an old fashioned reading circle like when we were in school to help celebrate the 20th annual uh, book fair by the, by the Library of Congress. Lance Schrader, who's our director of arts, and I, we received an email last week to uh, help support the National Endowment of the Arts while they support the poetry and prose part of uh, the 20th annual book fair. We decided to read West Virginia books and we have gathered some of the most important people of the literary arts in our state to help us today. And we're gonna start off right with our director of arts, Lance Schrader. Lance. Speaking of poetry, Bill Lepp, this is his anthology of Inept, Impaired, Overwhelmed, Tell Tales from West Virginia and Beyond. He is the host of our annual Poetry Out Loud competition that we have at the state. The excerpt I'm going to read is Mayhem Dressed Like an Eight Point Buck. At some point in my life, I will not learn not to go along with Skeeter Bar's ideas. Ever since his family moved down from Pennsylvania, the year we both turned four, Skeeter and I have been next door neighbors. Since that fateful day, there has not been a moment when either of our mothers rested easy, and it was all because of Skeeter's cockamamie ideas. Take deer season our senior year, for example. Skeeter showed up at my house at 3.30 in the morning wearing a grin so diabolical that I should have pled illness and stayed in bed, but instead, I gave him a cup of coffee and listened to his plan. To skip ahead, our day ended early, about seven that morning, with the two of us parked on the shoulder of Main Street receiving citations from an important public official for the heroic deeds we had accomplished, all the while a pack of astonished onlookers shouted accolades. The only problem was that the heroic deeds were only heroic in our eyes. The important public official was Sheriff Hasbro, the citations were tickets, and the accolades were all being shouted on behalf of the good sheriff. Sheriff Hasbro has to radio into the courthouse and disturb the judge's breakfast, but he proudly announced to the crowd that mayhem was a crime and that it looked like he would charge me and Skeeter with it. A roar of approval burst forth from the crowd. Now, Sheriff Hasbro has said to us, Get out of those costumes, get that dummy off the hood of your truck, and follow me in. The costumes to which the sheriff referred had been handmade by Skeeter and were almost perfect replicas of eight-point buck deer heads. The only reason I even consented to putting the mask on was because it was the day before deer season, not actually deer season, and Skeeter had promised that we would not go anywhere near the woods, nor would we, under any circumstances, get out of the truck. And then there was the dummy. Skeeter had filled an old pair of coveralls with hay, fastened on a pair of boots, gloves, and a hat, and then tied the whole thing to the front of his Ford. It's simple, he said. We put on the mask and we drive around town with the dummy on the hood, get it? Like we're a deer and it's people season. And we bagged one. And then we pull up to Sullivan's store and say, can we check this here? I had to admit that it sounded funny, but funny in the sort of way that you hope your dad never finds out that it was you. To keep our fathers from finding out, we left the house before dawn. I don't like to worry my mother or lie to her, so I left a note explaining my whereabouts. It said, out with the deer and the dummy. That way she would know I was doing something related to deer season and that I was with Skeeter. We had to wait until first light if we wanted anyone to see us, so we hid in the state park put the mask at our feet, and slept for a few hours. Now, usually the park is a safe place to hide. It is true that the park did not open until sunrise, but generally speaking, the police do not bother you if you looked innocent or if you were parked way up the service road where the patrol cars seldom ventured, as were Skeeter and I. The pre-dawn air was bitter cold, as usual. Skeeter's truck was low on gas, so we couldn't run the heater because we were, as usual, short on cash. And the wind was blowing, which normally wouldn't have mattered, except that the passenger side window had frozen in the down position. 
Before long, there was frost on the windshield, frost on the dummy tied to the hood, and frost in our veins. The only way to stay warm was to put on the deer mask. We woke up to the sound of a car horn. Someone was sitting in their car facing us, their bright lights on. In the early morning gray, I could just barely make out the silhouette of a police car. Of all the days in the year, this would be the day the cops decided to check out the service road. The driver's side door opened slowly, and Sheriff Hasbro cautiously advanced toward us, his flashlight drawn. He had a bewildered look on his face as I had ever seen. In retrospect, I guess he had good cause to look so confused. It is not every day that you come across a pickup truck stopped in the woods with a man tied to the hood and two figures staring out of the cab. Two figures who look remarkably like a couple of deer caught in the headlights. I stuck my head out the window and grunted like a full-fledged buck. Sheriff Hasbro jumped sky high. Skeeter started the truck and we pulled quickly around the police car and down the service road. Sheriff Hasbro had not asked us a single question, nor suggested in any manner that Skeeter and I could understand that we were in trouble. Thus, we did not feel like we were fleeing arrest, but as we found out later this morning, Sheriff Hasbro saw things in a different light. I turned the CB on to the police channel. Sheriff Hasbro was saying, well, Tom, I don't care if you think, do you think I'm crazy. There were two deer driving Skeeter Bart's pickup truck down the service road, and by God, I believe they had Skeeter tied to the hood. We can only hope so, was the reply. The comment was not lost on us. Well, continued the sheriff, whoever it is, they're headed straight for Main Street. They won't get away. Now, the smartest thing to do when you're obviously caught is to give up, count your losses, and head home. Unfortunately, doing the smart thing was not our strong suit. And as long as we were driving down Main Street in deer costumes with a man tied to the hood, it was a pretty safe bet that this was not going to be the day that we turned over new leaves. Small towns have many quaint traits that make them special and endearing, little traditions which you can count on to make you feel at home. One thing you could count on in Half Dollar West Virginia that was folks would be up and listening to their police scanners while drinking their morning coffee. As we came into town, you would have thought that Orson Welles was landing a spaceship at City Hall. Throngs of people, most still in their robes and slippers, lined the street. Having heard the sheriff's conversation about the two deer driving the stolen pickup, they had come out in droves to see the show. Sheriff Hasbro was still on the radio trying to figure out the best way to stop us. He was none too eager to pull over two heavily armed and obviously dangerous deer. Opting for the better part of valor, Sheriff Hasbro was not following with the lights of flashing and sirens of blazing, but was rather discreetly developing a plan. In fact, if we hadn't picked up his transmissions on the radio, we wouldn't have known that he cared about us at all. Unprovoked and unimpeded, Skeeter and I drove through town at a safe speed with no thought of surrender. And then over the CB we heard, better call Skeeter's dad animal control in the FBI. The word sent a shudder through our bones. It could only mean one of two things. Either Skeeter's dog, Axel, was an international terrorist, and the sheriff was calling Mr. Barth to let him know that animal control had been authorized by the feds to have Axel taken out. Or Skeet and I were in a lot of trouble, and they were about to call his dad. Our dad scared us a lot more than the FBI. We decided it would be best to pull over and wait for the sheriff. The rest, well, I've already told you about the citations and accolades. They say that true forgiveness only comes after absolute repentance and that you must forgive, that you must forever remain both contrite and sincere, struggling every day not to repeat your actions, nor ever to take the glory from the original deed. I believe I speak for both Skeeter and myself when I say, from the bottom of my heart, that we might never be forgiven for the actions of that day. Thank you, Lance. Now we have with us from probably one of our most important partners throughout the state, Lisa Dunmeyer from the Tamarack. And uh, Lisa is going to come and read 
And what's important about the Tamarack is if you want to buy a lot of West Virginia books, that's where you can buy them. And I'm sure you'll tell us about that since you're their marketing director. Welcome, Lisa Dunmire. Hi there. As Randall mentioned, we have a lot of great books at Tamarack, all by West Virginia authors. Um, the one that I've chosen to read today is called M is for Mountain State. This is written by Mary Ann McCabe Riley and illustrated by Laura J. Bryant. Climb to the top of letter A. Allegheny Mountains point the way to a place that you can go and admire the beauty down below. What's the buzz about letter B and the animals it features? Black bears, birds, and honeybee, and lots of other creatures. If you see the letter C or a dome glistening in the sun, you'll know you're in our capital, the city of Charleston. Drummers make a distinct sound. Dirt is formed into a sacred mound. These help us discover letter D and our state's special ancestry. Educators teach us about letter E, like a man named Robert, named Booker T. And Eleanor Roosevelt gave us a sample of how to educate by example. F is for the flag. That tells you a lot about our state. It displays so many symbols that make West Virginia great. Look through a window, take in the view. Glass bottles, vases, and even marbles too. It should be very clear to see that glass begins with letter G. Letter H happens to be for historic towns, once raided by a man named Brown. Huntington and Hillsborough too have lots of history to offer you. Letter I is for industry, coal and salt, and even trees. Fuel to keep us nice and warm and provide safe shelter from the storm. Anna Jarvis helps us celebrate J she honored her mom on a special day. And now throughout the entire land, we tell our mothers we think they are grand. Not every word you read is an easy word to say. Kanawha, for example, is the word for letter K. A valley, a river, and a county too. All called Kanawha, just to name a few. A landmark's lost, but can be found. Look above and below the ground. Find Lost World Caverns, Lewisburg, and letter L. They're located near each other, as you can tell. M may appear like mountains, peaks reaching for the sky. Our nickname is the Mountain State. It's easy to see why. Wondering if there's life on Mars or anywhere among the stars? Visit this place that begins with N, with great frequency return again. Olympic athlete and all around O, Mary Lou Retton sure put on a show. The smiling gymnast made us stand and cheer. 1984 was certainly her year. Presenting a page with plenty of peas and the only state with two of these. Panhandles, that is, both north and east, make unique boundaries, to say the least. Did you think you would see a quilt or perhaps a quilting bee? Seems as if you always knew quilts would represent the letter Q. Rafting on rivers brings us rapidly to R. With so many rivers, you can travel far. We can use them for fun and recreation. Rivers are also important for transportation. Strong and solid, you wouldn't expect less from the sturdy letter S. Seneca rocks stand proud and tall, nature's very own climbing wall. Trees that give us lots of wood. Trees with apples that are oh so good. Trees with names that sound so sweet make letter T a special treat. Now it's time to take a turn. Letter U for a place to learn. Universities are a place to cheer, especially when you're a mountaineer. Vandalia gatherings for letter V, a celebration filled with glee. Music and dancing and lots of fun, something to enjoy for everyone. What in the world could be better for you than a visit with wonderful W. Welcome to West Virginia's White Sulphur Springs, a place to relax and enjoy many things. Letter X lets you know you're near a place a train might go. Excitement builds as locomotives climb. 
up steep hills and back in time. Soaring high in the sky is where we find the letter Y, and Chuck Yeager could be found flying faster than the speed of sound. Sum it up with zenith, the mountain's very top. Letter Z seems to be a very good place to stop. From here we can see from A to Z, an almost heavenly view, and the inspiring beauty that West Virginia offers you. Thank you, Leah. I think I said Lisa at the beginning. I am so sorry. I should put my readers on. Uh, now we're going to go to the West Virginia State Archives. Uh, the archives are, of course, a part of the Department of Arts, Culture, and History. And we like to say the archives are the keepers of all the stories in West Virginia. And we have one of our best storytellers with us, and that is historian Cody Brown from Ravenswood. Cody? Thank you, Commissioner. I am uh, Cody Brown, Library Assistant for the West Virginia State Archives, and I'm proud to be here to represent them here at the Culture Center today, as well as the Department of Arts and Culture and History, and of course, as a native West Virginian, my hometown of Ravenswood. Today, I'm going to be covering the story of John Henry, written by Julius Lester. You have probably never heard of John Henry. Or maybe you have heard about him, but don't know the ins and outs of his comings and goings. Well, that's why I'm going to tell you about him. When John Henry was born, birds came from everywhere to see him. The bears and panthers and moose and deer and rabbits and squirrels and even unicorn came out of the woods to see him. And instead of the sun tending to his business and going to bed, it was peeping out from behind the moon's skirts trying to get a glimpse of the new baby. Before long, Mama and Papa came out on the porch to show off their brand new baby. The birds ooed and the animals awed at how handsome the baby was. Somewhere in the middle was one of the oohs, or maybe it was one of the backside of the ahs, that the baby jumped out of Mama's arms and started growing. He grew and grew and grew. He grew until his head and shoulders busted through the roof, which was over the porch. John Henry thought that was the funniest thing in the world. He laughed so loud the sun got scared. It scurried from behind the moon's skirts and went to bed, which is where it should have been all the while. The next morning, John Henry was up at sunrise, but the sun wasn't. He was tired and decided to sleep in. John Henry wasn't going to have none of that. He hollered up into the sky, get up from there. I got things to do and I need light to do them by. The sun yawned, washed its face, flossed and brushed its teeth, and hurried up over the horizon. That day, John Henry helped his papa rebuild the porch. He had busted through, added a wing onto the house with an indoor swimming pool, and one of them a jacuzzi. After lunch, he chopped down an acre of trees and split them into fireplace logs and still had time for a, ha a nap before supper. The next day, John Henry went to town. He met up with the meanest man in the state, old fair-faced Freddy, sitting next to him on the big white horse. You know what he was doing? He was thinking of mean things to do. Fair-faced Freddy was so mean, he cried if he had a nice thought. John Henry said, Freddy, I'll make you a bet. Let's have a race. You on your horse and me on my legs. If you and your horse win, you can work me as hard as you want for a whole year. But if I win, you have to be nice for a whole year. <laughs> Fair-faced Freddy laughed, an evil laugh. <laughs> it's a deal, John Henry. His voice sounded like bat wings on tombstones. The next morning, folks lined up all along the way the race would go. John Henry was ready. Ferret Face Freddy and his horse were ready. Bang! The race was on. My great-granddaddy's brother, cousin, sister-in-law, uncle's aunt was there that morning. She, saw, she said everybody saw Ferret Face Freddy ride by on his big white horse, and there, sure enough, moving didn't see no John Henry. That's because he was so fast that the wind was out of breath just trying to keep up with him. When Ferret Face Freddy crossed the finish line, John Henry is already on the other side, sitting in a rocking chair and drinking a soda, Mom. After that, Ferret Face Freddy was so nice, everybody called him Frederick the Friendly. John Henry decided it was time for him to go on down the big road. He went home and told his mom and daddy goodbye. His daddy said, you've got to make something of your way in the world with son. These belong to your granddaddy, and he gave him two 20-pound sledgehammers with four-foot handles made of whalebone. A day or so later, John Henry saw a crew building a road. 
At least that's what they were doing until they came on a boulder right smack dab where the road was supposed to go. This was no ordinary boulder. It was hard as an anger, it was so big around, it took half a week for a tall man to walk from one side to the other. John Henry offered to lend them a hand. That's all right. We'll put some dynamite to it. John Henry smiled to himself. Whatever you say. The road crew planted dynamite all around the rock and kaboom, kablamity, bam, boom, bang, boom. The dynamite made such a racket. The Almighty looked over the parapets of heaven and hollered, it's getting too noisy down there. The dynamite kicked up so much dirt and dust, it got dark. The moon thought night had caught her napping and she hurried out so fast, she almost bumped into the sun who was, steep, who was still climbing the steep hill toward noontime. When all the commotion from the dynamite was over, the road crew was amazed. The boulder was still there. In fact, the dynamite hadn't even knocked a chip off of it. The crew didn't know what to do. They heard a rumbling noise. They looked around. It was John Henry laughing. He said, if you gentlemen would give me a little bit of room, I got some work to do. Don't see how you can do what dynamite couldn't, said the boss of the crew. <laughs> John Henry chuckled. Well, you just watch me. He swung one of his hammers around his head. It made such a wind that the leaves blew off the trees and the birds fell out of the sky. Ring! A hammer hit the boulder. That boulder shivered like you would on a cold winter morning when it looks like the school bus is never going to come. Ring! The boulder shivered like the morning when freedom came to the slaves. John Henry picked up his other hammer. He swung one hammer in a circle over his head. As soon as it hit that rock, bang! The hammer on his left hand started to make another circle. Ring! Soon the ring of one hammer followed the ring of the other one so closely it sounded like they were falling at the same time. Chips and dust were flying from the boulder so fast that John Henry vanished from sight. But you could still hear his hammers ring, ring. The air seemed to be dancing with the rhythm of his hammers. The boss of the road crew looked up. His mouth dropped wide open. He pointed out to the sky. There in the air above the boulder was a rainbow. John Henry was swinging a hammer so fast he was making a rainbow around his shoulders. It was shining and shimmering in the dust and grit like hope that never dies. John Henry started singing, I got a rainbow ring, ring, tied around my shoulder, ring, ring. I ain't gonna rain, oh, it ain't gonna rain, ring, ring. John Henry sang and he hammered in the air, danced in the rainbow, shimmered in the earth, shook, and rolled from the blows of the hammer. Finally, it was quiet. Slowly, the dust cleared. Folks could not believe their eyes. The boulder was gone. In its place was the prettiest and straightest road they had ever seen. Not only had John Henry pulverized the boulder into pebbles, he had finished building the road. In the distance where the new road connected to the main one, the road crew saw John Henry waving goodbye. A hammer on each shoulder, the rainbow draped around him like love. John Henry went on his way. He had heard that any good man with a hammer could find work, work, work building the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad through West Virginia. That was where he had been going when he had stopped to build the road. The next day, John Henry arrived at the railroad. However, work had stopped. The railroad tracks had to go through a mountain, and such a mountain. Next to it, even John Henry felt small. But a worker told John Henry about a new machine they were going to use through the tunnel, tunnel through the mountain. It was called a steam drill. It can hammer faster and harder than 10 men, and it never has to stop. The next day, the boss arrived with the steam drill. John Henry said to him, well, let's have a contest. Your steam drill against me and my hammers. <laughs> Man laughed. I've heard you were the best there was, John Henry, but you can't even outhammer a machine. Well, let's find out, John Henry answered. Boss shrugged. Don't make me never know mine. You start on the other side of that mountain, and I'll start the steam drill over here. Whoever gets to the middle, first is the winner. The next morning was all still. The birds weren't singing, and the roosters weren't crowing. When the son didn't hear the rooster, he wondered if something was wrong. So he rose out a couple minutes early to see. Once he saw a mountain as big as hurt feelings, one on one side was as big as a machine hooked up to hoses. It was a belching smoke and steam. As the machine attacked the mountain, rocks and dirt underbrush flew into the air. On the other side was John Henry. Next to the mountain, he didn't look much bigger than a wish that wasn't going to come true. He had a 20-pound hammer in each hand and muscles as hard as wisdom in each arm. As he swung through them in the air, they shone like silver. And when the hammers hit the rock, they rang like gold. Before long, tongues of fire leaped out with each blow. On the other side of the boss of the steam drill felt the mountain shudder. He got scared and hollered, I believe this mountain is caving in. 
From the darkness inside the mountain came a deep voice. It's just the hammer sucking wind. Just my hammer sucking wind. There wasn't enough room inside the tunnel for the rainbow, so it wrapped itself around the mountain on, on the other side where John Henry was. All through the night, John Henry and steam drill went at it. In the light from the tongues of fire shooting out of the tunnel from John Henry's hammer's blows, folks could see the rainbow wrapped around the mountain like a shawl. The sun came up extra early the next morning to see who was winning. Just as it did, John Henry broke through it and met the steam drill. The boss of the steam drill was flabbergasted. John Henry had come a mile and a quarter. The steam drill had only come a quarter. Folks were cheering and yelling, John Henry, John Henry. John Henry walked out of the tunnel into the sunlight, raised his arms over his head, a hammer in each hand. The rainbow slid off the mountain and around his shoulders. With a smile, John Henry's eyes closed, and slowly he fell to the ground. John Henry was dead. He had hammered so hard and so fast and so long that his big heart had burst. Everybody was silent for a minute. Then came a sound of soft crying. Some said it came from the moon. Another one said she saw the sun shed a tear. Then something strange happened. Afterwards, folks swore the rainbow whispered it. I don't know. But whether it was a whisper or a thought, everyone had the same, th same knowing at the same moment. Dying ain't important. Everybody does that. What matters is how well you do your living. First one started clapping, then another, then another. Soon everybody was clapping. The next morning, the sun got everybody up to early to say goodbye to John Henry. They put him on a flatbed railroad car, and the train made its way slowly out of the mountains. All along the way, folks lined up both sides of the track and were cheering and shouting through their tears, John Henry, John Henry. John Henry's body was taken to Washington, D.C. Some say he was buried on the White House lawn waiting one night, and the president and Miss President was asleep. I don't know about none of that, but what I do know is this. If you, say, if you walk by the White House late at night, stand real still and listen real closely, folks say you might hear a deep voice singing, I got a rainbow, ring, ring, tied around my shoulder, ring, ring. I ain't going to rain, no, I ain't going to rain, ring, ring. John Henry. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. In West Virginia, we are very fortunate that Governor Justice and First Lady Kathy Justice are huge supporters of the arts, and they're very committed to making sure that we get the very best education for our students. And most importantly, they love kids. So from the governor's mansion today, representing the First Lady, we have the executive director of the governor's mansion, Vicki Shannon, and she's from Williamson. Vicki. Thank you, Curator Reed Smith, for that lovely introduction. And on behalf of First Lady Kathy Justice, um, I'd just like to say, as Randall stated, um, how important education is um, to everyone. And the First Lady has chosen education as her primary initiative here in West Virginia through a, a program called Communities in Schools. And we surely do appreciate everything that the Library of Congress and the NEA do to support programming in West Virginia. And Cody, you're a hard act to follow, you and John Henry, but I'm gonna give it a whirl. The book that I'm reading today is called Rocks in My Pockets. To start at the beginning, the Woods family lived on a farm on top of the top of the highest mountain in these parts, a way up where the wind is your neighbor all year round. The farm was on old rocky soil, but it was the best the family could afford, and so they worked out a living any way they could. They'd raise knee-high corn, and walnut-sized potatoes and call them a good crop. You'd hear no complaints. Their house was drafty, their animals skinny, and their clothes patched out of what was at hand. But one thing they all did have was pockets, and that was mighty important, for in the pockets they carried the rocks. Rocks? Yes, rocks. Every morning when they'd set out to work, father and mother, grandpa and Tommy and Jenny, father would always say, 
Be sure ye put some rocks in your pockets now. Put them rocks in your pockets or the wind will be likely to blow ye away. And he was right, for the wind did blow fierce across their mountaintop fields. So father and mother and grandpa and Tommy and Jenny would all pick up the rocks and carry them in their pockets off into the fields. And not a one of them was ever blown away. The rocks were a lot of fun, too. Tommy and Jenny would often play pass with them or hide and find games. And even mother and father and grandpa would frequently worry the stones around in their pockets. Just good to know they're there, grandpa would say. Who knows where my old dry bones would end up if this wind ever got a hold of me. In the evening after supper, Grandpa or Mother or Father would often tell a story they remembered from the early days. As the tales were told, you might see one or the other of them rubbing one of the rocks in their hands. In the cold of winter, these same rocks would be set in the fire and then taken out and wrapped in heavy socks to lay between the cold covers. There were, as any of the family could have told you, they were, excuse me, as any of the family could have told you, mighty handy rocks. There was always a heap of them, smooth and slick, strewn by the chimney, gleaming from all the rubbing and polishing they got. But once, after a hard winter and a miserable spring, the rocks became more than handy. They became... Well, you'll see. One day in early summer, a couple of high, fancy ladies from the city came by looking for antiques for what might impress their neighbors. But the Woodses didn't have much in the way of antiques. Nope, Father Wood said they didn't have anything to sell. But just one of the ladies noticed the pile of rocks by the chimney. My, but aren't those beautiful, exclaimed the one. Indeed, the other echoed. And they were kind of pretty, slick as glass, bright as the stars, with colors in them that just showed right through. Well, well, we've never seen stones like this before. What kind are they? asked the first. Well, I don't really know them by any name. They're just plain old rocks. Would you sell them to us? Well, I don't really have any reason to sell them to you. Oh, but we'd pay you a fair price. They're kind of rare now, aren't they? Well, Father Woods began to catch on then. And he said, well, yes, maybe they are. You don't see many of this kind where you come from, I guess. What would you take for them, the ladies asked sweetly. And then he told them a reasonable price, and they paid him. And were those ladies thrilled? From the way they talked, there wouldn't be anybody in all of Pittsburgh or New York or wherever they came from that had stones like these. So they went back to their homes, put their stones on display, and bragged all over them. Now I'm going to stop here and leave you in suspense because I think I'd like to encourage everyone to visit your local libraries and check books out and check this book out. I think your families would enjoy it for generations to come. And also, please remember to visit your local bookstores. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vicki. And as we go from the governor's mansion to the governor's tunnel, we are very fortunate to have with us today the governor's deputy chief of staff, Anne Vincent Erling. Anne is from Clarksburg, and when I took her book over, I, one of my absolute favorite books is When I Was Young in the Mountains by Cynthia Ryland, and she had flipped through it, and she said, oh, I love this book because of my grandfather. And Anne, we are just thrilled that you could be with us here today. Thank you for helping us to celebrate the word.
Thank you, Randall. As the mama of three and as now a Nana of a four-year-old, it's my pleasure to get to come here and read with y'all today. Um, get to spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, my book is called When I Was Young in the Mountains by Cynthia Ryland. And yes, my grandfather was a coal miner and I remember being a little girl in Farmington, West Virginia and listening every, um, every day to the radio to see if that was the day he was gonna get to go into work that day. When I was young in the mountains, grandfather came home in the evening, covered with black dust of a coal mine. Only his lips were clean, and he used them to kiss the top of my head. When I was young in the mountains, grandmother spread the table with hot cornbread, pinto beans, and fried okra. Later in the middle of the night, she walked through the grass with me to the Johnny house and held my hand in the dark. I promise never to eat more than one serving of okra again. When I was young in the mountains, we walked across the cow pasture and through the woods carrying our towels. The swimming hole was dark and muddy and we sometimes saw snakes, but we jumped in anyway. When I was young in the mountains, we pumped pails of water from the well at the bottom of the hill and heated the water to fill 10 tubs for our baths. Afterwards, we stood in front of the old black stove, shivering and giggling, while grandmother heated cocoa on top. When I was young in the mountains, we went to the church in the schoolhouse on Sundays, and sometimes we walked with the congregation through the cow pasture to the dark swimming hole for baptisms. My cousin Peter was laid back into the water and his white shirt stuck to him, and my grandmother cried. When I was young in the mountains, we listened to the frogs sing at dusk and awoke to cowbells outside our windows. Sometimes a black snake came in the yard and my grandmother would threaten it with a hoe. If it did not leave, she used the hoe to kill it. Four of us once draped a very long snake, dead of course, across our necks for a photograph. When I was young in the mountains, we sat on the porch swing in the evenings, and grandfather sharpened my pencils with his pocket knife. Grandmother sometimes shelled beans and sometimes braided my hair. The dogs lay around us and the stars sparkled in the sky. A bobwhite whistled in the forest. And when I was young in the mountains, I never wanted to go to the ocean, and I never wanted to go to the desert. I never wanted to go anywhere else in the world for I was in the mountains, and that was always enough. And as we say in my family, the end. Thank you, Ann. And Ann, thank you for everything you do to help us at the Department of Arts, Culture, and History. You keep us going, and I know your love for the arts and culture, and we really appreciate working with you. Okay, when we decided to do this, I immediately uh, got a hold of my friend and colleague, Karen Goff at the Library Commission, and she hooked us up with Lisa Hicheski, who is our uh, consultant for youth services, and she got all the list of books together, but she hid a book because she wanted to read it, and it's the new book about Katherine Johnson, Counting on Katherine, How Katherine Johnson Saved Apollo 13, and she wanted to read that herself, so Lisa, please join us. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you for helping us out. It was my pleasure to help you out because I am a very big supporter of reading to children. Um, my mother did that to me when I was very young, and I think she's the reason I'm a librarian. Um, but before I went to library school, I went to West Virginia State College, and Catherine is a graduate of West Virginia State College as well. So that's why I held this book back. <laughs> Catherine loved to count. She counted the steps to the road. She counted the steps up to the church, the number of dishes and spoons she washed in a bright white sink. The only thing she didn't count were the stars in the skies. Only a fool, she thought, would try that. Even so, the stars sparked her imagination. What was out there? Catherine yearned to know as much as she could about numbers, about the universe, about everything. Catherine's boundless curiosity turned her into a star student. She was so bright, she skipped three whole grades. She catapulted right past her brother. 
he wasn't too happy about that. By the time she turned 10, Catherine was ready for high school. But back then, America was legally segregated by race. Her town's high school didn't admit black students of any age. Catherine burned with fury. She wanted more than anything to keep learning. There was still so much to know. Count on me, Catherine's father told her. By working day and night, he earned enough money to move the family to a town with a black high school. Catherine loved high school. She was good at every subject, but math was still her favorite. Dreaming of becoming a research mathematician, making discoveries about the number patterns that were the foundation of the universe. In those days, though, there were no jobs in, as research mathematicians for women. Professions available to them were teaching and nursing, so Catherine became an elementary school teacher. She liked her job and she loved her students, but she never stopped dreaming about exploring numbers. In the 1950s, the U.S. government's National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics hired thousands of new employees. It even started hiring black women as mathematicians. Catherine heard about the mathematician's job. Her heart raced with excitement. Perhaps her dream could come true after all. But when she applied for one of the positions, she was told they were already filled. Catherine had to wait a whole year until new spots opened up. Her patience paid off, she got the job. A few years later, the Soviet Union sent a rocket ship into space, launching the space race with the United States. NACA was rolled into a new space agency, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. Catherine now found herself at the heart of America's space program. She worked as a computer. Electronic computers were not widely used yet, so she calculated a long series of numbers. All the computers were women. They were given that task by men who thought the job was boring and unimportant. That didn't bother Catherine. She knew that without her computations, a spaceship couldn't reach its destination nor return safely to Earth. Catherine's reputation for accuracy and strong leadership skills, she was known for asking plenty of questions, got her promoted to Project Mercury, the new program designed to send the first American astronaut into space. Mercury's mission, missions were going to be very dangerous, so dangerous that even the project's star astronaut, John Glenn, refused to fly unless Catherine okayed the numbers. You can count on me, she said. Glenn's spacecraft Friendship 7 orbited the Earth three times, returned safely at home, and Glenn became a national hero. Catherine was promoted again. Now she was asked to calculate the flight paths for Project Apollo, the first flights to the moon. Count on me, she said. On July 20th, 1969, the Apollo 11 astronauts walked on the moon. Their feat was celebrated around the world. More triumphs followed. Apollo 12 rocketed to the moon in November of 1969. Apollo 13 launched April 11th, 1970. But on the third day of the Apollo mission, the worst thing happened, an explosion in space. Could the crippled spaceship make it to the moon? And if it didn't, would it be able to make it safely back to Earth? The three astronauts aboard board were in grave peril. Commander Jim Lovell told the Mission Control, Houston, we've had a problem. Back on Earth, Katherine Johnson got a phone call. Her flight path ca calculations would have to be done all over again and perfectly. It would be the toughest challenge of her life. Katherine told Mission Control, you can count on me. She rolled up her sleeves, took a deep breath, and began doing the math. She worked hard and fast. A few hours later, Catherine's computations were finished. The flight path to return home would take the ship around the far side of the moon. From there, the moon's gravity would act as a slingshot to zing the ship back to Earth. To get home, the crew of Apollo 13 would have to follow Catherine's course exactly by burning off fuel at precise intervals. If the astronauts made a mistake, their shift would drift through space forever. Catherine waited anxiously to hear the astronauts report. Finally, it crackled through the loudspeaker. 
We've got it. Apollo 13 was back on track. Katherine Johnson had done it. She'd brought Apollo 13 home. She was no longer the kid who dreamed of what lay beyond the stars. She was now a star herself. Thank you, Lisa. Words, words, words. Books, buildings, broadband. These words have been stressed to me the past two and a half years by our secretary of the West Virginia Library Commission, Karen Goff. At the Department of Arts, Culture, and History, yes, arts, that's our main focus, but the literary arts are in safe hands with our secretary of the West Virginia Library Commission, Karen Goff. Karen? Thank you, Randall. Nothing does a librarian's heart more to see people walking around carrying books than reading them and listening to them being read. This has been a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for getting it organized. Now, Vicki read from uh, a book by Mark Harshman, who is the West Virginia Poet Laureate. In addition to being the Poet Laureate, and a marvelous storyteller, Mark Harshman is also a former elementary school teacher. Now, Lisa wrote, read about Katherine Johnson, who liked to count things. Well, the book I'm going to read from by Mark Harshman is called Only One, read with the permission of Cobbles Hill Books, which is a division of Penguin USA. This book has been called a counting book. It teaches a math concept that young children have trouble grasping, that multiples of one thing can equal a single, totally different thing. We probably all remember trying to convince a child that four quarters was the same thing as a paper dollar. It's a hard sell. Using the setting of a county fair, and a few words backed up with Barbara Garrison's wonderful illustrations, Mark teaches the lesson much more effectively than I ever did. The book concludes with another equally important social concept. There may be a million stars, but there's only one sky. There may be 50,000 bees, but there's only one hive. There may be 500 seeds, but there's only one pumpkin. There may be 100 patches, but there's only one quilt. There may be 12 eggs, but only one dozen. There may be 11 cows, but only one herd. There may be 10 cents, but only one dime. There may be nine players, but only one team. There may be eight horses, but only one merry-go-round. There may be seven peas, but only one pod. There may be six jewels, but only one necklace. There may be five babies, but only one nest. These were baby rabbits. There may be four wheels, but only one wagon. There may be three mus musicians, but only one trio. There may be two ropes, but there's only one swing. But the best thing of all is that there is only one me and there is only one you. Thank you again for this afternoon. Thank you, Karen, and thank 
each of you for coming and joining us. The last thought I would like to leave you with, if you can read, you can achieve and be and do anything. So go get a book and read. Thank you all, and I want to say thank you to uh, Educational Broadcasting Authority for helping us film. Thank you again to the Library Commission. Thank you to the arts, to the archives. Thank you, Tamarack. Thank you to the Governor's Office. Thank you to the Governor's Mansion. And thank you to all our wonderful students in West Virginia who read.